I've taken the liberty of breaking things into three categories for us this morning. And one will take us back, one will meet us right here, and the next will take us forward. And so my questions really will start with looking back. So my first question for you is election night. What was it like? Euphoric. And by then we knew we were going to win because we had a handle on the early returns and absentee voting in a few states, well, more than a few states, where we had really invested millions of dollars, unseen by the media, I think unnoticed by many people. All of you out there appreciate the value of grassroots, and those of you who are in corporate America, bottom-up consumerism. And we really tried to do that, Harris, early on with money we didn't necessarily have. But we saw how important it was to reach those voters where they live early through the, what we call EVAB, so early voting absentee balloting. And the RNC was incredibly helpful to us in that regard as well. <clears throat> so those investments paid off. But for example, we knew by the time early voting had finished in Florida over that weekend before Election Day, that whereas Governor Romney had lost by 167,000 votes, Donald Trump had lost by 88,000 votes. And when I told him that, he said, I lost by 80. I said, no, 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 it's actually you're winning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I figure this spin. <laughs> and uh, just little pieces like that that I can give you from probably six or seven different states. And then you had states where early voting is not the tradition. Absentee voting, sure, but not early voting. Right. States like Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and Michigan. Which swung into play. Swung into play where yeah. we knew that in Virginia, actually, which he did not win, but he will in the real act. <laughs> we knew that their tradition was to vote on election day, and so to front load the schedule in certain places and back load it in other places. Uh, but, but election night was pretty euphoric in the following way. It was, I have it on my phone actually, my husband took a screenshot of Uma Abedin calling my phone at 2.30 oh, a.m. And I said, oh, hey, Uma. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how's it going, Kelly? I'm like, oh, great. And I mean, you'll recall that it wasn't until they called the state of Pennsylvania at 1.36 a.m., who was counting, that um, it was 20 electoral votes that we knew, just mathematically speaking, he would need to be declared the victor that night. That was important because as we were leaving Trump Tower to head over to the Hilton at about 1.45 a.m., John Podesta appeared on the TV screens and said, have a great night, everybody get home, go home and get some rest, we'll have no further comment tonight. And we just couldn't believe it because it was not what was happening. And so, the, quickly decided what should we do, and I said, well, I frankly think we should do at the Hilton what we've been doing here all night, which is let's just go watch the returns. We can wait all morning, we can wait all week if we have to. And those of you like Marlene who worked on the George W. Bush recount in Florida, I said we can wait 35 days. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we decided to do that, but we didn't know if Podesta was speaking for himself or for Hillary Clinton herself. And by the time we got to the Hilton, we knew mathematically he would win. The Clinton people had arranged the day before with me, Robbie Mook, her campaign manager, who was better than most over there, more honest anyway, about why they lost. Uh, he had emailed me the night before and said, here's what we would like to arrange tomorrow. They expected they would win. And he said, if the AP calls the race for Secretary Clinton, we will wait 15 minutes for Mr. Trump to call her and congratulate the <laughs> scene. And and, uh, and then we're going to, she'll go out on the stage and declare victory. If the, if the AP calls the race for Mr. Trump, and I can see him laughing, you know, he had laughing emojis in there. <laughs> then um, Secretary Clinton will call him within 15 minutes of the AP calling the race to congratulate him. So he said, this is so, he said, your point of contact is Uma Abedin, the number. We were on the airplane going from Manchester, New Hampshire to Grand Rapids, Michigan for the final rally. And so I saw it popped up at about 11.30 p.m. So I ran into him and I said, sir, this is what Robbie Schmuck is saying. And he said, well, don't respond. And I showed it to Steve Bannon and I said, you just want Uma's number. Stop talking <laughs> Anyway, so I never responded. And then that night when everything was going wrong, I'm like, I should probably respond. I'm like, that sounds like a great plan. Yeah. <laughs> 2.30 a.m., Uma called and she said, hi, Kellyanne. She said, Secretary Clinton would like to speak with Mr. Trump, and I said, now? She said, was he available? I'm like, he's very, very available. And me, he was no 
everyone is sort of gracious and like the mother hen of the campaigns, all the younger staffers, and never raised my voice and the whole thing. I'm like, everybody shut up now! <laughs> and I handed him the phone and I said, to, I said to Governor Pence, just make sure she concedes because John Podesta had not. I said, make sure we hear that word. And looking back, Harris, mm -hmm. that was such an important word for us to hear because what happened? Uh, they started protesting. Jill Stein decided to spend millions of dollars in a recount. Hillary Clinton was playing well, fast. Well, so else happened. She too. congratulated and, and she conceded. But it was it was very exciting. I just saw the video last night in the back. Of somebody who showed me the video of when we found out <coughs> we had won. And it was exciting. But let me just, if I could just stop. First of all, I want to tell you all, I get a lot of praise. And I want to say something. I want to say two things about that very quickly. It's very gratifying, it's very kind, but it's also a victory and a future that is shared by all of us. All of us in this room, no matter how hard you, you worked against him or for him, I know you worked for the country, and I know you love the country. And I want to tell everybody right here and right now, we are all in this together. I feel that everybody shared this victory. If you did something 20 years ago, if you made a couple phone calls this time, if you decided in the end you were going to support him and, and Governor Pence. If you decided that you couldn't do that, but now you're supportive, I'm telling you, we hear you. And this is a victory and a future shared by all. The other thing is that the praise that I get really, it needs to be shared across our senior staff. We weren't large in number, but we were very gritty and entrepreneurial and scrappy. And that's what happens when you have a fraction of the budget and a fraction of the staff that Team Clinton had. I heard over there, Harris, they had one person assigned to one county. I said, no, let me get this right. Hold on. <laughs> so, <laughs> knee deep in the data. So, basically, there's one person over in Brooklyn who's in charge of Lackawanna County, Pennsylvania. Like, oh, no, that one, there's three people. I'm like, I have, you know, I have one person in charge of three states. So, but it was, we had such an amazing team. And, and they really deserve the credit. And Mr. Trump himself and his family, his children, his adult children, Barry, Melania, his grandchildren, their spouses, Unbelievable sacrifices these people have made just to do this. Every time you look at him, remember, he has somewhere else to be and other millions to, to, to earn. They're making such tremendous sacrifice, and I think that mattered to America. They looked up and said, you're going to go to Washington and no one anything. And you know, the family, of course, is beautiful and brilliant, but at the same time, they're also doing this for all of us, and it's not lost on me. It's one thing I wanted to convey today as somebody who's around them every day. Real quickly, one, one other thing that happened along the way <laughs> is that I noticed because we were waiting for the secretary to come out and concede publicly, and that took several days. So had we all waited for that to happen, exactly. I guess we would have just had suspended animation about what was going on. Um, all right, so that was one of the, the way back questions. Um, I kind of want to, I think we're going to move right in here. You mentioned what's coming next in the re-election, but I have one that, that really is about you. And I always say that you fit my BSF principle, balance, sparkle, faith. That's how I live my life. And I, I look for other women who do that too. I'm always curious to know how you do that. And I know we started here, but I know that I see a lot of men in the room, maybe some dads in here. If you could just address moving forward, the last time you and I talked before we were officially with the campaign was inside our studio on Fox and Friends. I was coming on to do something, I think leave the national anthem with some kids, and you were coming off the set. And you said, and I asked you, would you take a job with the administration? And your answer was no. I, I want to know how you got to yes. And what it takes to balance it all. But how'd you get to yes? Harris, I got to yes to a combination of persuaders and motivators, I would say. The persuaders were definitely Donald Trump, who's very persuasive, as we've seen. Vice President-elect Mike Pence, who I've worked with for probably 10 or 12 years. And one day, I got I walked into my office during the transition, and I had Mike Pompeo sitting there. I said, seriously, the CIA director? I'm like, this is really, this is really good. He said, I just think a tour of duty in the White House would help. Um, and also Valerie Jarrett, I want to give her a shout out. Very close, maybe the closest advisor to President Obama. And she's been incredibly gracious and personally helpful to me in navigating all this. I ran into her and her daughter Laura last night and she served, she got there on day one and she left on the last day and she's been there all eight years. And I felt the way she described the culture in the White House regardless of who its occupant is. And I felt the way she described the, the different structure 
in working in the West Wing versus being out on the campaign or even during the transition where I feel like we're still trying to win Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and it's been so busy. She, she's right. And I also, um, I'll tell you, implicit in joining Donald Trump's team, let alone as his campaign manager, I feel implicit in that bargain is that we would follow him inside if we were so honored for him to ask. I feel like you have to, that's part of following him through. And I'll tell you, my four children obviously were the primary consideration. They are terrible ages for me to do this, 12, 12, 8, and 7. I remember the 12, kids, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, of women who were opting out of the workforce. And these were doctors and lawyers and business women, really like the big brains in this room. And they were doing it because, I mean, in many cases, they had a husband who was a, a breadwinner, but they were doing it because of elder care needs and certainly child care. But I remember hearing them say, Harris, don't fool yourself into thinking that that baby knows who's giving it the milk and who's you know tickling its tummy because we all want to be there in those years. Yeah. It's, it's when they're older and they get off that bus and they need somebody to talk to and they felt really diminished, their value was diminished that day as a young girl or a young woman. They need someone to talk to, the math work is getting more intense. And that's actually the ages where my children are now. So they were the first concern, of course, and, and remain it. But I also thought that that was unfair to Donald Trump and, the way, and how I know him to be. For me to talk just about all my kids, I, it's unfair to him and who I see him every single day. I know the people who work at the Trump Corporation for decades. I know what a family friendly place it is. I know the women and the grand the, the mothers and the grandmothers there. I know a man who's Orthodox Jewish and he has left every Friday at a certain time in the fall and winter pretty early in the day when it doesn't matter if you know the place is on fire or somebody's head is on fire, which happens um, <laughs> in the Trump world here and there. He leaves. And everybody respects that, including and beginning with Donald J. Trump, because that is that is the bargain they have, and that he respects that. So it'll be a very family-friendly uh, White House, and I do believe that. But I'll put my foot down because those kids are going to come first. And as I famously said on Fox Business, I don't have I don't play golf, and I don't have a mistress, so I have a lot of time. <laughs> talk to a kid about money problems or what we had or didn't have. In a very charmed childhood, but South Jersey's version of the Golden Girls with the house could take off. But I'll tell you, as a sing I, being raised by a single mom, I made tremendous sacrifices to keep me in public in, to, in Catholic school and to just get it right. She, you know, she was married at 21, had me 19 days after turning 23, and by 26 was divorced and took her high school degree and just figured it out. And I think that's a very common American story, then, now, and in the future, for many women. And the other reason I hesitated to go inside, I'll be very frank with you, is I was staring at an absolute gold mine. And it took me a while to avert my gaze. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while to avert my gaze. And I thought, wow, I can do these five things, get these TV contracts and these speeches, I can make in one speech what my mother made in a year. And I thought that was almost an homage to her to say this is the American dream, that your daughter can give some grossly overpaid speech that one of you would have been supporting, thank you. Um, <laughs> and I thought it was homage to my mother, but I really felt the better homage to women, and to my three daughters, and son, and to my mother, and to just all of us, was to go inside and try to make a difference from the inside out. And that really was the major motivator in the end, which. So I wanted to close that loop. All right, real quickly before I move to Evan, and I've got a question in each category from some of you, and, and we'll move it along here. Um, going inside, we wonder now, and I mean, we the media would wonder, how much outside Kellyanne Conway will we get to see? Because you had a very outward-faced role 
up until now. So when you say go inside, are, do we have to peek into the windows? Am I going to be arrested? <laughs> I'm kidding. You're always welcome. You're all always welcome there. Harris, I've been trying to reduce my TV exposure for a while now. I just work for someone who won't allow it. Um, but the reason I want to do that is I think there's just a significant difference. I know there is. In, and tomorrow, just around this time, when we drop the elect and welcome, as our, welcome him as our 45th president of the United States of America. And I believe the way that we present ourselves publicly really should be different. And then running, then talking about data in a campaign or <coughs> dealing with the latest faux crisis, you know, hashtag breaking news. I'd like to tell these stations, like, if you've been saying it for five straight, do, five straight days, it actually is not breaking news. Yeah. <laughs> the definition. Amen. Um, <laughs> I feel like there is a different way, but if, and, and then we will present it differently, but we have this incoming press secretary, Sean Spicer, who will be the face or a face of the administration in Portland. He's my friend. We work very closely together. I'm very happy he's there. We'll be working closely together along with some other people in comms and press. Um, but I will see. I think that TV exposure on behalf of the President of the United States should be sparingly, it should be done sparingly and strategically. But I expect to be very involved in a policy portfolio, which is why I wanted to be counselor to the president. Nice, clean title. Um, people don't know the other things I've been doing for him and with him because they only they see me on TV. But that's 5% of my day. All that really means is I start my day two hours earlier and end it two hours later. Wow. In between, it's called the work day. And there's been a great deal of policy there. I think it pays, pays to be old. I've been saying this for a while. It pays to be old. Um, 50 is the new 35. <laughs> have some legislation, legislative, legislative work in there and we'll have, um, I would to work very closely with Ivanka Trump. If she decides to go inside, she needs to make that decision and announce it. And Dina Powell, who all of you will know from the George W. Bush administration on the White House Office of Women and Girls. Mm -hmm. So much that we'd like to do, really pick up on the work that Marlene and Shelley did for Secretary, Labor Secretary Elaine Chow some 15, almost 20 years ago, uh, which was groundbreaking work. The workplace is everywhere, the workforce is everyone. And I think trying to find that balance for lots of women. I just, I also just want women to realize that they're doing a great job and that only they can really decide what's best for them and their families, uh, whether their families are elderly relatives looking for some help to navigate that paperwork, mm -hmm. uh, Medicare and Social Security, or th their families are um, the children or grandchildren, I just want them to know they're doing a great job and that they, they shouldn't judge each other, they shouldn't be judged in that regard. So if I can take this platform in a way that helps um, small business owners, Karen Kerrigan has done unbelievable work on that over the years, our state legislative folks, people like Lisa Nelson, well not people like Nancy <laughs> Bowden, or Heather Higgins, I mean we have women who have been on the policy front lines for decades and I just feel that we should be able to harness that and leverage that in a way because this is a man of action and the excuse of divided government is over. It is not accidental that the country put Republicans in the House and Senate, the governorships and over a thousand state legislative seats that we gained during the Obama years. It is not an accident they've done that. They want action. They expect results and delivery. And even thinking about waiting six months, Harris, to go inside to get my family settled here into right. new schools and new home, um, maybe put a little coin in my pocket before I went in, that just doesn't, doesn't apply to Donald Trump because I know what he's going to do on days one through four, and it's just head spinning. And it's what the country wants, really. They want action. By the way, um, that's Monday. So, yeah, that's Monday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, I'm done with my questions. I mean, I could be here all day, but then the lights would be out. Uh, I want to